service here at the Tron this evening. If the folk out in the corridor were just quieting down a little bit, we can start our service. Thank you. We're going to begin by singing. That'll wake them up. Number 783. Blessed be the everlasting God, the Father of our Lord. His boundless mercy now be praised. His majesty adored. Number 783. Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We rejoice indeed, O God, our Father, to sing of the great inheritance won for us by our Lord Jesus Christ and kept for us in heaven until the great day of his coming, the day of his revelation, when this whole world at last will see his glory and be amazed at his glory in the church And we thank you, Lord, that we have this hope, sure and certain, because of his resurrection from the dead, and that that word of life and of truth holds us and gives us the power for living, the confidence in you, and enables us to walk in faith, 
not by sight, knowing that what is seen is what is going to pass away, but what is unseen, what is promised to us in your gospel, will never fade, never spoil, never ever be taken away from us. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us to have our eyes opened continually to that which is unseen, but which is so much more real and which is apprehended by the sight of faith when you open eyes to these eternal truths in Jesus Christ our Lord. We gather tonight, Lord, to have our hearts again touched and opened by your word. And we pray that you would do that so that we might live the better for you. We thank you for the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us and have pointed the way. We remember many of us this evening, our leaders, those who spoke the word of God to us and showed us the glory of the gospel of Christ for the very first time, led us into his light. We thank you for them. Many, many, I'm sure, as we could name before you tonight. We thank you for their faith, and we pray that you would help us to faithfully follow you as they did, putting our trust where they showed us in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, this week very especially for the life of one of the great leaders of the church in this last century, Billy Graham, who died this week. Some here tonight, some in our own fellowship, whose eyes were first opened to the gospel of Christ in the Kelvin Hall in 1955 when he preached to so many people in this city, as he did throughout many decades all around the world, perhaps preaching the gospel to more people in the whole history of the church. We thank you, Lord, for his testimony, for his witness, for his unfailing faithfulness to you and to your gospel right into old age. We thank you for the way that you kept him true, not being ensnared by so much that is false, false in teaching, false in life, that has snared so many who have had a very public stage in the Christian faith. We thank you for his ministry. And above all, we thank you for the greatness of the gospel he proclaimed. And we pray that many who have risen up to call him blessed because of the word that he proclaimed that brought them life, that in remembering him this week, they would be stimulated all the more to proclaim that same gospel to others, to know its power, to know its worth. We pray there might even be any Lord, many, Lord, in our city this week who remembered being there in 1955, but perhaps having gone forward and having committed their lives to Christ, in due time drifted, fell away as the cares of this world, as the entanglements of riches. So many things grew up to choke, to stifle that word at work in their lives. May be hearing the news reports and seeing the clips of his preaching in the past might once again draw them back, back to the place where they once delighted to be in the midst of your people, praising your name. And so we ask, Lord, that he being dead yet might still speak a word of life, the word of light and the gospel of Christ to many hearts. We thank you, Lord, that all over the world today, this same gospel that he proclaimed, that so many have proclaimed throughout history, this same gospel is bearing fruit and growing. That there are people meeting today, just as we are, in large groups and small in countries where they can do so openly and in places where to do so is dangerous and where meetings will occur in secret and in hiding. But in all these places, people will be gathering and are gathering and have gathered already today to praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. How we thank you, Lord, that your church is growing all over this world. And that indeed in many places where your church faces great hardship, great 
and real and present persecution. There it is growing the most, the fastest. How we thank you that the very gates of hell shall never prevail against the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray very especially tonight, Lord, for our friends and partners in the Delhi Bible Institute and for their prayer team as they go tonight to spend these next few days in Bhopal looking for an opportunity and a place to begin their next Bible ashram as they seek to expand in their vision of 2020 that they should have a center for training and for evangelism in every one of the state capitals of North India reaching that 600 million people across the north part of that great subcontinent. We pray for Isaac Shaw and his team, thanking you for all that they've accomplished in recent years and all the new ashrams that have been opened. We pray that you would guide them and lead them to just the right place in Bhopal, that they would find a suitable site and in due time all the resources necessary that a new work might begin there to train men and women and to proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for our partnership with them and for the great joy that it has brought to us to be able to partner with them and to share in their excitement and in their vision to reach out with the gospel in that vast and populous land. We pray for protection for many of their workers who face real Hardship, real opposition, physical persecution. Give them courage, Lord, we pray. Above all, give them a knowledge that they're not alone, but that they do your work and that your spirit it is who is in them and who will guard and to keep them in all that they do, empowering them to be witnesses to the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, as we think of your work throughout all the world, we think also of our own small corner here in this city, in our homes, in our workplaces this coming week, in our schools and classrooms, with our friends, with our children. Lord, look upon us, we pray. The task is so great, the need is so great, and our strength is so small, we're so conscious of our need for your help. How thankful we are that you are the God who has promised to meet all of our need. That when we come to you asking, you will give. When we knock, seeking your response, you will always open to us. So Lord, we draw near to you tonight in faith and in trust, coming before you, seeking the strengthening of your word. Meet us, we pray. Help us, strengthen us, and equip us, and send us on our way, the better to serve you for the glory of Christ and for the increase of his kingdom here in our city, among our friends, with our family and our neighbors. So hear us, Lord, and help us, we pray, for we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a warm welcome this evening, and uh, particularly if you're visiting with us, if you're here for the first time, then uh, we trust that you feel at home with us here. Do stay behind afterwards. There'll be a refreshment served at the front here, also downstairs in the foyer, and uh, it's a great time to share with one another, to encourage one another, and uh, to meet together following the formal part of the service. Downstairs this evening in the Farsi service. Uh, there are several baptisms taking place as uh, a number of our brothers and sisters profess faith in Christ and are baptized and are uh, admitted to join our fellowship here. So uh, it's an evening of great joy for them as it was for us last Sunday morning as we admitted a number of new folk to membership with us. So do be thinking about them uh, also this evening. One or two things, uh, if you weren't here this morning, uh, pick up one of these notice sheets, they're on the, uh, on the trolleys outside the doors, and they've got numbers of notices there for the coming week and also for uh, a little bit further uh, in advance. Also inside them there are uh, leaflets here about a day being held by Cornhill Scotland on Saturday the 17th of March, that'll be here, his word in my hands. Every year 
Cornhill holds a teaching day and it's open to all. It's particularly relevant perhaps if you're involved in some way in uh, teaching the Bible, perhaps just one-to-one -one with a friend or in a small group or a home group or Sunday school, whatever it might be. And uh, this year their day is going to be focusing on uh, teaching from the epistles, the letters of the New Testament. And uh, Andy Gemmell and Peter Dixon are going to be uh, the main speakers at that. So you can come along. Uh, you have to book in. It's only five pounds, but uh, they're keen that you book in so they know who's coming. And uh, if you're a student and you book before the 14th of March, you can come for free. If you're after the 14th of March, you can pay five pounds. So it's up to you. But uh, I would choose to book early, wouldn't you? That'd be a good idea. But we'd love for you to come along. And uh, some of you will have been before. Uh, but you can come again because every year they do something a little bit different and it's a different part of the Bible uh, that's being looked at. So that's something uh, 17th of March. Do book up and uh, find out more about that. Now I'm going to ask Margarita to come up uh, because I want to uh, ask uh, a few questions about Christianity Explored because, um, here we are Margarita, you've been helping uh, with the team leading in Christianity Explored and just yesterday I think was the was the away day. So tell us how that went. And just tell us how the, the course has been going in general uh, this, this time. Um, so it's actually been my first time doing the course and leading, which, uh, and it, I think it's been, it's been amazing. It's been so great. The day away yesterday, it was an opportunity for a bit of a change of scenery. Um, actually, everyone came over to our flat and we did um, a few sessions and had lunch. And it was just a really nice environment. Um, people, I think, felt quite open to ask a few more questions. And mm -hmm. um, it's been really encouraging. It's been really good. Good. Tell us how many folk have been, uh, have been on the course uh, this time. So we've had about a good seven or eight core people that have come every week, which has been also... Yeah, still very encouraging, and um, yeah. <laughs> and what happens? What uh, it's been on Monday nights, hasn't it? Yeah. So um, just just run us through a uh, for those who don't know, run us through a sort of typical evening. Tell us what what happens and, and what you do. So the course is really great and very well structured. By the end of it, you go through the whole of Mark, which I think is is just yeah, very great. You, we specifically have been looking at who Jesus is, um, what he has done, and um, how, how should we respond um, by looking at all this, the evidence that has been provided to us. So we start off by looking at a few questions from, that have been given for the week before. So that's like time to kind of look into it deeper. And so you then, get homework, do you? Yeah, you get homework. You have to do your homework. <laughs> you do, but it's not long. It's like 15 minutes. But it's, uh, we've had actually quite a good number of people come with questions from bits in Mark that they've read throughout the week that they maybe have been a bit confused about or want to know a bit more about, which has been really good. And then we start off the session with a few more questions about what we're going to be doing that night. There's a small video and then just a couple of more questions at the end um, about what we've just seen. So it has been, it's really well, really well structured, very easy to follow through. And um, we've had some really great questions. Okay, great. And, and the folks who have been coming on the course then, how have they found out about it? Uh, so they, I think quite a few of them have come from it being just advertised in church mm -hmm. and there have been flyers out as well and uh, a couple have come from people in church bringing them along which has been really great as well, really encouraging. So you can bring a friend along and come yourself and, and, and sit yes, with them? Yes, yeah, it's um, definitely, it's such a relaxed environment that you... Um, yeah, bring your friend and you can go through all these questions together and uh, yeah, it's been really good. Good. And now we're going to be running the next course uh, starting after Easter. I think it's the 10th of April, Tuesday nights, I think. Is that right, Paul? Yeah. Um, so we want to be thinking ahead to that. Um, give us some advice about that in terms of uh, what we might... Uh, be thinking about if we've got a friend or somebody we'd like to, to come. Why, why, is, why is doing it after Easter a good time? So it's a, it is a great opportunity. Easter is a time where people might be thinking a bit more about going to church or thinking about it further. 
about Christianity further. And also, I think it's really well timed with the Mark drama, and they will really make it an easy opportunity just to ask someone to come along. If you're worried about um, how to ask someone to Christianity Explored, you might want to ask them to the Mark drama first and then kind of t lead it on from there. Or if you're worried about taking someone to the Mark drama because they might have some questions afterwards, um, just ask them to go to Christianity Explored because you'll definitely look through some of Okay, that. so we're, we're hoping it's going to work well together, having these two things to uh, stimulate interest in yeah. looking at Mark further but also give folk confidence that, that, that they can yeah. do that. Okay, yeah. good. So you would be recommending use the Mark drama yeah. and then use it as a, uh, as a follow-up fairly soon after Easter. Yeah, I think it would... It's, it's, um, sometimes it's a bit daunting asking someone, but if you have these, uh, like these two events together, it might be slightly easier to, to kind of put them together and then you go through Mark twice, which, is gonna be, which will be good. <laughs> good. And you've enjoyed it and you'd recommend it to others? Definitely. It's, um, it's been a really humbling experience, actually, just being able to see the joy that people um, have once they, they hear more about Christ or they learn more about him. Um, it's just, it's been really great. I definitely recommend it. Bring a friend along. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Margarita. That's great. Well, uh, if you... If you saw the notices this morning, or if you pick one up afterwards, you'll see the Mark drama uh, will be on uh, on Good Friday evening at the Kelvin Grove building, on Easter Saturday afternoon uh, in the Queen's Park building, and on Easter Saturday evening here. So that gives three opportunities uh, for that, and uh, you can make use of those uh, and Christianity Explored as well. Great. Thank you. We're going to sing again, and uh, him this time is on the screens, and then Paul's going to come and uh, read the scriptures to us. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day, a glimpse of glory from the Lord Jesus Christ.
Good all. Please do turn in your Bibles to Revelation and Revelation chapter 2. And we're looking at verses 8 to 11 of Revelation chapter 2. You'll find that on page 1028 if you're using one of the church Bibles. This is the second of the seven letters that the Lord Jesus wrote to the churches in Asia. So verse 8 of chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to us this evening. We turn again to our hymn books and to number 236. This is a hymn tinged with the reality of suffering. It's a hymn written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a pastor murdered by the Germans at the end of the Second World War. Number 236, by gracious powers so wonderfully sheltered and confidently waiting, come what may. Number 236.
as the musicians play for us, the offering for the Lord's work will be uplifted. As that goes on, perhaps reflect on those words we just sung by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm pretty sure he had the words of Revelation 2 firmly emblazoned on his mind as he wrote these words. But the musicians will play and the offering will be uplifted. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, who through thine only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, has overcome death and opened unto us the gate of everlasting life, we humbly beseech you that as by thy special grace you put into our minds good desires, so by the continual help we may bring the same to good effect through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, worlds without end. Amen. Well, as we come to God's word, we sing the hymn uh, in our books, number 503. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Number 503. <laughs>
Well, please do turn back to Revelation, and we'll be looking at these verses from chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, the letter to the church in Smyrna. The year is AD 154. The prisoner is a man named Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna. The Roman proconsul urged his prisoner, swear and I will set you at liberty, reproach Christ. What would Polycarp do? He's a man in his 80s at this point. And he would have been in his late 20s when John's letter of revelation arrived at the church. Polycarp, in all likelihood, would have heard the words of Revelation 2 read out in the church. Perhaps he himself read out these very words. Words from the Lord Jesus that urged the church there in Smyrna to be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. With these words no doubt etched into his mind, Polycarp answered the Roman proconsul with these words, Eighty and six years I have served Christ, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? With that refusal to approach Christ, Polycarp was ex- executed burnt at the stake in public. Having been faithful to the end, having been certain of the crown of life held out to him, he remained faithful. Polycarp was a real and living example, not only of the reality of Christian suffering, but also as a fruit of this letter to the church in Smyrna. He lived out these words Almost 60 years after first receiving them, he obeyed the word of his Savior. He was faithful unto death. So what was it that enabled Polycarp and countless others before and since to remain faithful unto death, to remain faithful in the face of fierce opposition and suffering? Was Polycarp superhuman? Was he predisposed to bravery? It's tempting, isn't it, to put folk like Polycarp on a pedestal such that mere mortals like you and I can't possibly hope to emulate him. That sort of faithfulness is beyond me, you might think. But I think that is a wrong inference to draw. Some of the bravest Christians I know and have met are very ordinary-looking people indeed, not the sort of folk you would think would be brave and courageous, but they are. And it can be so easy to forget, can't it, as folk who've grown up in unprecedented peace and stability for many centuries in a culture dominated and directed by Christian values, easy to forget that suffering is normal for Christians. It has been down through the centuries. Jesus calls his church to take up his cross, doesn't it? Suffering comes sooner or later to those who identify with Christ, our Lord and Savior, who himself suffered to the point of death. And he calls those who follow him to that same pattern. Those who are Christ's are to live the cross-shaped life. So what is it then that enables ordinary Christians, people just like you and me, to be faithful unto death. Well, let's allow this letter to the church in Smyrna to speak to us, to teach us, and to train us to that end, that we'd be faithful even unto death. Two key points this evening. First, Jesus knows the suffering of his church. And second, Jesus strengthens his church for the suffering to come. So first then, verse 9, Jesus knows the suffering of his church. We see there in verse 9 that he knows. Jesus knows the suffering his church endures. He knows the nature of their suffering. 
And the very fact that Jesus knows brings comfort to those who suffer, doesn't it? He sees. He knows. He sees everything. Nothing goes past him unnoticed. But Jesus sees not just what is visible. He doesn't just see what was experienced by the church there in Smyrna. He sees more. And what he sees brings true perspective to the church there in Smyrna. He sees their poverty, yes. But in reality, they're rich. He sees the slander. But he sees the reality behind the slander. He sees the real source of it. Three things in particular that the Lord Jesus sees here about the church in Smyrna. Three specific things about the nature of the suffering for the church there in Smyrna. Tribulation, poverty, and slander. First, tribulation. Jesus sees their tribulation, their affliction. And the word here refers to all sorts of troubles and hardships that the church may have been suffering in Smyrna which would have been very painful indeed. Smyrna was a city hostile to Christians. It was a city that had strong allegiances to Rome. It was the first city in the ancient world to build a temple in honor of the goddess Roma. It then built a second temple in honor of the emperor Tiberius. Strong links to Rome in this city in Asia. Strong links and the imperial cult would have made life very difficult indeed for Christians there who refused to bow down to Rome. But not just that, there was a large Jewish population, and we'll see in a moment, they were actively hostile to the church there in Smyrna. They suffered tribulation. Jesus saw that. But he also sees their poverty. Their poverty is likely due to the general hostility they encountered in the city. The very fact that they were Christians and known as such would have made participation in the trade guilds that were the very hub of economic life in the city very difficult indeed. One commentator makes the point that people living in Smyrna could aspire to economic prosperity and greater social standing only by participating to some degree in the Roman cult. If you wanted to get ahead in Smyrna, if you wanted to have a good economic outlook, you had to be involved in the guilds and the Roman cult. But to be a Christian, it would have made it very difficult indeed. And so these Christians find themselves cut off from key networks in the city's economy. And they were consigned to a crushing poverty, barely able to make ends meet. That's the meaning of that word poverty there just about making it. Their businesses would lose credibility as soon as their Christian faith became more widely known. And so these dear Christians there in Smyrna, they knew great material poverty. But the Lord Jesus sees that. He knows it. But he knows more. Notice the parenthesis there in verse 9. But, he says, you are rich. Jesus sees the greater reality, and he tells them. They may seem poor, and they certainly are that from a material, earthly perspective. But, in another sense, they are really very rich indeed. Quite the contrast to the church in Laodicea. Just look across the page, to chapter 3, verse 17 where we get Jesus' assessment of the church there in Laodicea. He says there in 3.17, For you say, that is the church in Laodicea, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. There is a wealth that is of no value at all. And there is a wealth often hidden from the eyes of the world, a wealth that can't be seen on your bank statement, a wealth that really counts. And that is the wealth the church in Smyrna had. It's the wealth that the church in Laodicea lacked. They were truly rich, 
in the eyes of the Lord. Now, economic privation of the order known to the Smyrna Christians is not something that we've experienced really in the West, is it, for a long time. To be poor as a direct result of being an unashamed Christian, that concept is rather alien to you and I. But for how long? Certain jobs, certain positions, certain careers may not be open to Christians because of particular views, particular things you're not, refu- you're not prepared to compromise on. When those days come, have those words etched into your mind. Yes, we may well be poor in the world's eyes, but in Jesus' eyes, we are rich. But even if we don't experience the economic privation on the scale of Smyrna yet, there is still a sense in which, as Christians, we don't enjoy the fruit of wealth to the degree that we could enjoy it and that those around us do enjoy. I think of friends of mine who enjoy good but by no means high incomes, and they go on at least two exotic holidays every year, They have all the latest gadgets. Anything they want, they buy. They recently bought a lovely home, doing it up. They're living the sort of lifestyle that, well, I could live if it wasn't for the fact I was a Christian. Now, that can be hard, can't it, to see others enjoying the good life now, enjoying all the comforts that we might be able to enjoy if it wasn't for the fact that we give to the Lord's work if it wasn't for the fact that we committed to being here Sunday by Sunday, not jetting off to Europe every other weekend. It's hard not to feel like we're missing out compared to our contemporaries. I don't know about you, but I look at people I was at school with, and they're way up there, enjoying all the pleasures now. It's hard not to feel like we're missing out. It doesn't much feel like it, does it, that Christians are the most privileged people in the world, according to Jesus. It doesn't much feel like we're rich. But there is a wealth that is of no value at all. And there is a wealth often hidden from the eyes of the world. A wealth that can't be seen on your bank statements. A wealth that really counts. In Jesus' eyes, if you're a follower of him, you are rich. But it's not just tribulations and poverty that the church there in Smyrna were suffering. They were also slandered. Look at the end of verse 9 there. The slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. The source of the slander is from those who identify as Jews, but Jesus shows their true colors Regardless of their heritage, they had become, through their fierce opposition to and slander of the church, they had become a synagogue carrying out the bidding of the great enemy himself, Satan. Now, the exact nature of the slander we're not told, but certainly in the case of Polycarp, which I mentioned at the beginning, it was Jewish enemies who denounced Polycarp to the Roman authorities. Slander. And slander is a great weapon in the Satan's arsenal, isn't it? It intimidates, it demeans, it destroys reputations, it sticks. People love to believe slander, don't they? Just think about all the accusations flying about in the media in recent months. Now, some of those, of course, are true and terrible. But many, without consideration for any evidence, have been presumed guilty. A career has been ended. The slander sticks. And likewise in the church, slander can bring down a ministry. Satan knows the effectiveness of slander to destroy churches, to destroy their witness, to discourage Christians. But know that Jesus sees the truth. He saw right through those so-called Jews. He saw their true motivation. He saw their true leader. He saw it then and he sees it 
today when it happens. So when you are slandered because of your faith, because of your unwillingness to deny Christ, know what and who really lies behind that attack. And know too that Satan, although a powerful enemy, is a defeated enemy. That is one of the great realities of the book of Revelation. Satan, he's been defeated. Christ is reigning. He's victorious. I remember back in my student days, it's gradually receding into my memory. When I was a student, I was on the CU committee, the Christian Union committee there in Nottingham. And uh, at the time, I had agreed to do an interview with the student newspaper. Now, looking back, it was a very foolish thing to agree to. But I was told that it was going to be a very wide-ranging article about all the different faith groups in the university. And they were just wanting to find out how things operated, what was going on, and so on. So I agreed. About one minute into the interview, I realized that there was an agenda behind it all. I saw it was a setup. And I was questioned pretty hardly about the Bible's teaching on the role of women. I was questioned very fiercely on how we operated as CU, how we chose and selected the next committees. All of that it was a total hatchet job. And when the article was published, it was front page, distribution of over 20,000 copies around the university, front page, see you in hell. Now, quite a catchy title, I thought. But the article was a pretty one-sided affair. And taking lots of what I said out of context, it made me look like an absolute idiot. My words were misrepresented. And all I was doing was explaining Orthodox Christianity on the whole range of issues. Now, that was slander. The CU was dragged through the mud, as was my name. But it was uncomfortable and unpleasant, even though it was ham-fisted, and anyone reading objectively could see it was such. But it was a major distraction. Hours of meetings with the SU followed. But I have no doubt who was really behind it. It wasn't just the Student Union magazine. We have an enemy, and he delights to slander God's people. Well, such was the nature of the suffering of the church there in Smyrna. Tribulation, poverty, and slander. But note that the church in Smyrna hadn't done anything wrong. It's one of the two churches of the seven that receives no rebuke whatsoever. They suffer because they're doing things right. And that's hard to take, isn't it? We often subconsciously expect life to go smoothly if we're honoring Christ. But theirs is the pattern for all who follow Christ, and we should expect it. If not now, then someday. For Polycarp, it was six decades down the line. But he had absorbed the teaching of this letter. And so should we know that Christ knows and that he sees more than we can merely observe. There is a reality behind the reality we see. And Jesus sees it. He knows it. But Jesus doesn't just observe the suffering of his church. He equips them to face it. This is our second point, verses 10 and 11. Jesus strengthens his church for suffering to come. Jesus is frank, isn't he? There is no sugarcoating here. He doesn't gloss over things. No. Jesus is realistic and honest about what he calls his people to. He's realistic and honest about the costliness of following him. Yes, his church has suffered. But he says, verse 10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Two things on the horizon for some of the Smyrna Christians, prison and death. Prison is the first thing he mentions. He says, behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days. You will have tribulation. Who is the person behind it? Well, again, Jesus reveals the reality. It is the devil himself 
who is behind the imprisonments of these Christians. The devil will throw some into prison. But even as that's the case, it is not beyond the scope of God's sovereignty. There is a purpose behind it. Look at the second half of verse 10. So that you may be tested. When under trial, the genuineness of faith is exposed. It is tested. The Apostle Peter, in his first letter, wrote this. You have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is in the heat of trial that our faith will be truly tested and will truly shine forth, not before then. I don't know about you, but I often imagine situations or scenarios in life, and I think I just wouldn't cope if that happens. But the Lord doesn't equip us for theoretical situations, but actual ones. In those moments when the trials do come, when the sufferings do come, that is when the testing comes. And so we pray that in those moments, God would strengthen us for those times that we would not fear, but rather would be trusting him. And he will equip his people for those moments. Jesus reveals the person behind it. He reveals the purpose, but he also reveals that it's not in perpetuity. Rather, it's a limited suffering. Note what he says in the middle of verse 10. For 10 days, you will have tribulation. Now, whether that's 10 literal days or to be taken symbolically as it's a limited period of time, either way, it's limited. It doesn't go on forever. And it's limited either by the fact they'll be released or because some will be killed. And death is the second thing on the horizon for some of those who receive this letter. Look on to the end of verse 10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. This is the second imperative, the second instruction given to the church there in Smyrna. The first was do not fear. And the second is be faithful unto death. And as with all the commands from the Lord, there is a great promise attached. Be faithful, and I will give you the crown of life. The reward for enduring death is life, life everlasting, life with God in the new creation. The believers were not to look at the suffering to come so that they trembled with fear, but rather to look through the suffering to come and beyond to the Lord who promised to deliver them to see beyond the suffering itself to what lay beyond it. And that is what conquering would look like for this particular church. Look at the end of verse 11. The one who conquers, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. That is to say, that though they may endure terrible sufferings, even death in this world, they would not be touched by the far more terrible and everlasting judgments that will surely come on the day when God will judge all. The Lord Jesus said elsewhere, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That is the perspective that Jesus pressed upon his church in Smyrna. And for all today who face persecution and even death for their faith in him, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And the fact that guarantees this promise is that the Lord Jesus who makes this promise is the one in verse 8 who is the first and the last, who died and came to life. Jesus has overcome death. He rose again. He lives forever. He's defeated it. And that very fact 
in addition to these words of promise, did then and does now bring great comfort to his suffering church. There is life beyond death in this world. There is a far more terrible judgment to come, and you don't fear that if you are Christ's. To the one who conquers will not be hurt by that second death. And Jesus not only knows the suffering his church faces, but he suffered himself. He faced tribulation, poverty, slander. He faced death, but death could not hold him. He is the first fruits of the new creation, the first one resurrected from the dead, the one whose resurrection guarantees the resurrection of all his people. And so in light of all he's done, in light of all he says, Jesus tenderly encourages his church, he encourages you, in the face of terrible trials, do not fear what is to come. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Nobody else can promise that. Only Jesus. Only he can give you everlasting life. So hold firm to him. Well, that was the message to the church in Smyrna. And it's a message that Polycarp clung to, even to the end. And as we close, just three implications, three observations on this passage. First, there's always more going on than we can see. That's something we bumped into again and again in this passage. We see things going on from a human point of view. We see poverty. We see slander, imprisonment, death. But Jesus, every time, gives us another perspective. He gives us the reality. Yes, you're poor, but in reality, you're rich. Yes, you're being slandered by these people, but really, Satan is behind it. Yes, you'll be put in prison, but really, it's the devil who's done that. Yes, you may die, but in reality, Jesus gives you everlasting life. Isn't that something to get firmly screwed into our minds? There's always more going on than we can see with our own eyes. Jesus sees the big picture. He sees reality. He's in control of it all. So trust him. There's always more going on than we can just see. Second implication, Jesus hasn't lost control if and when we suffer. Because there's always more going on than we can see, persecution does not mean that Jesus has lost control in a particular situation. In fact, it's often the very thing that Jesus calls us to, isn't it? He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Suffering for Christ is part of the Christian life. But the Lord Jesus, who knows all and is in control of all, he says to you, fear not. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus hasn't lost control if and when we suffer. But thirdly and lastly, conquering means living by Jesus' words and not by sight. Jesus is risen and ascended. But if we're honest, it doesn't much look like it, does it? It doesn't look to us as we look around at the world that Jesus is risen and ascended. But that is why God has given us his word. That's why he's given us the book of Revelation. It is a glimpse of a reality we cannot see. Jesus lifts the curtain on the seen world. And he lets us see what's really going on. We're called to live by his words, not by what we can see. It doesn't look like Jesus is risen and ascended. It doesn't look 
like Christians are the most privileged people in the world. It doesn't look like Christians are given the crown of life beyond death. But we're not to live by what we see. We fix our ears on what Jesus says. We fix our eyes on the unseen crown of life. We live by faith, faithful unto death, and he will give us the crown of life. Let's ask for his help to do that, shall we? Our Father in heaven, you give us, your people, great promises. Would you please help us to trust your promises, to trust your word? We are so limited in what we know and what we see. And you, the creator God, know everything. You see everything. You see reality. And so help us to be a people that live by faith, not by sight. Help us to be a people faithful unto death, knowing that beyond lies the crown of life. So help us, please, to be a faithful people. Strengthen us by your spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we close our time together by singing a hymn that lifts our eyes to our King to come, number 512. Rejoicing in hope, we wait for our King. His coming is sure. His conquest we sing, number 512. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, 
will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish ye. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.